So uh, the topic that uh, I'll just share some thoughts on uh, this afternoon is organizations in the age of algorithms. Um, now, there are many different types of organizations. Uh, later on, I think uh, David and Vinay and others will talk about, you know, uh, let's say, more modern uh, versions of what organizations and networks might be. But, you know, we still live in a world uh, full of companies, um, some quite big, and we rely on the services and the products that they supply. And so somebody has to consider how we can upgrade these companies and make them more ready for the 21st century. Uh, and so that's partly the, uh, the topic that I want to focus on today. So the way I would uh, look at this, we're at a very exciting time in terms of organizational development, uh, both because of the challenges that companies face, but also because we have this wonderful uh, connected technology at our disposal today, and that gives us entirely new possibilities for the way that we structure our companies and organizations and the way that we run them. If you look at the sort of challenges um, that we see in the real world, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that was exciting yesterday was Daimler announcing that on Autobahn uh, 8 in Germany, they already have a self-driving uh, truck which is in production, which is literally going up and down that road uh, today. And obviously there are other autonomous vehicles going around Europe right now. There are Teslas being sold in California and in, also in Europe which are ready uh, for their autonomous future as well. And yet what's interesting about this is that even the organizations involved in some of these innovations, so even organizations like Daimler and the other car companies, they're struggling um, you know, to move quickly enough to keep up with these developments. And I think that's a real uh, a real shift in the situation that they face. They used to be all powerful, uh, they used to be doing very well in all different areas, but now they have some real existential challenges and how they meet those challenges um, is gonna be a very important question. The other factor that I find very interesting is that you know, most of our organizations are based on a sort of model, an organizational structure that's really very old indeed. Um, it goes back to the late 19th century, adapted with Taylorism in the early 20th century. And aside from the addition of mainframe computers and maybe email and the internet, actually the underlying model of these organizations hasn't changed. But what has changed um, is their lifespan. So we're seeing a decline in the average lifespan of a large company uh, projected to go as low as about 15 years. And that's a big change when you think that many of the industrial companies in Europe are 100 years old or more. Um, so how they cope with that situation is, I think, a very, very interesting uh, question. What they used to have was a, a coordination system for work um, that was the best available at the time. So this is a picture of uh, Taylor um, looking over an actual worker and trying to find sort of ways of making them more productive uh, through telling them what to do. And that basic idea of management really hasn't changed. That's sort of what our managers are doing today even though this co control and coordination system is fundamentally no longer working. Um, and I think that's a challenge that many companies have yet to really understand. Startups are fascinating. Startups are usually structured very differently. They don't share many of the same precepts as large organizations, but they are not immune from this problem either um, because they have VCs, they have investors, they have advisors who are also naturally pushing them towards these old templates, these old models, because we lack the imagination uh, to see how a company can scale without having a top-down hierarchy, VP of sales, VP of HR, etc., etc. So even startups are often recreating uh, this tired, old uh, corporate culture. Very good example of the impact of this, I think, is Microsoft. Um, under Steve Ballmer, Microsoft had what they called a lost decade and it was largely a result of internal coordination systems. They had an employee review system that was very competitive, uh, not very cooperative, and it resulted in people fighting each other instead of fighting their competitors um, in the market. And so one of the first things that uh, Satya Nadella did when he came in was he said, look, our organizational structure is irrelevant. The only thing that matters is our ability to innovate and get that innovation out into the market today. 
And so he immediately changed that employee review system, removed it completely, and is trying to work on improving the culture of Microsoft so that instead of being internally focused, they're all about the customer, they're all about the ecosystem and their partners out there um, in the marketplace. So it's a very good case study, actually, of how a very simple element of organizational design can have uh, an outsized impact on their results and their performance um, in the marketplace. So I think it's fair to say um, not only are our current organizational structures not uh, capable of change, they're also not sentient. Yeah? They're not intelligent. They can't think. They can't evolve. They can't change. They're sort of stupid. So intelligent people go into the office in the morning, and they intersect with stupid processes, and they end up behaving less intelligently than they would if they were free to work in a way of their own choosing. Nowhere is that more uh, clear than when a company actually tries to change itself. So this is a, a sort of a, a slide from Henry Mintzberg. And he said, you know, this basically is the template, the model of the organization that we have today. And then we have a crisis like Microsoft faced, and we get the consultants in, maybe McKinsey come in and run around and study things. And then they produce an imaginative new reorganization. Uh, but somehow, although one or two, uh, you know, middle-aged or older males might change their seats, fundamentally, the structure is the same. It's absolutely unchanged. And that's really a lack of imagination. And I think that is a really serious problem. What you realize when you see how, just how hard it is to imagine another future, you realize that actually the structure of many corporates is not a coordination structure. It's a, it's a political control system. That's essentially what it is. It's a way of the people at the top trying to stay in control and pretend that they understand everything that's happening down below, which is not really the case these days. Now, as Paolo, uh, Paolo mentioned, you know, we've been working on the question of how to use social technologies inside companies to humanize their structures uh, for a long time, since, uh, in my case, since about 2002. And it's really interesting. You can put in social networks, you can use blogs and wikis and sharing tools and knowledge sharing systems and all these things. But it can impact positively on the day-to-day -day work of the individuals, but without culture change and without a sort of political reform in the organization, it can't actually change the underlying structure of how work gets done. So if you look at uh, many of the deployments of social technologies in the enterprise today, 50% are what my friend uh, Manuele Quintarelli describes as deploy and pray. You know, you just install it, it's an IT project, there you go, done, use it, but nothing really changes. Maybe a minority are focused on joining things together in a better way, in a more effective way, but actually very few have undertaken this sort of paradigm shift where the connected technology makes available entirely new structures and entirely new ways of working. And I think that's... Uh, that's an interesting question. But the technology is only one part of the puzzle. Obviously, the cultural side, the practice side is also important. And we have plenty of examples of how that can be done differently. And we have plenty of examples of what you might call a sentient organization. So Morningstar is a famous case study that's been around for a long time. Morningstar uh, doesn't have managers, but each employee uh, engages in peer-to-peer -peer agreements with each other. So it's basically a peer-to-peer -peer management system where people negotiate contracts. They say, I'll do this if you do this. You know, you produce this amount and I'll distribute this amount. And it works pretty well. Um, they're a very successful uh, sort of tomato processing company uh, in the US. And this system means that they can work at a much lower cost uh, and with a much higher degree of responsiveness to changing market needs and, and customer needs as well. So in a way, it's a thinking organization because it's made of people. And I think that's the key difference between Morningstar and a traditional uh, corporate structure. Similarly, in a more modern company, if you look at someone like Valve, they're a software company, they make games, and what they encourage their employees to do is to flock towards what seems like the most meaningful work at the time. So they have this lovely handbook uh, for new employees where they say, okay, how do you work without a boss? Come up with a good idea, tell somebody about it, work on it together, and ship it, right? That's how simple they regard the value creation process in their organization. And what they do is they give everybody a desk with wheels. And so if you feel like your work is getting tired or you're not doing something meaningful, 
you take the brakes off your desk, you move your desk somewhere where it feels like there's something cool going on, and you join in. You say, hey, how can I help? How can I join this project? And so you get this sort of natural evolution going within the company where good projects and successful projects attract more people and sort of standard processes and things that are not so interesting tend not to attract uh, people. So it's a really interesting example of, again, a thinking, sentient organization. So the question for me is, you know, how can we learn from what's going on today and go beyond these exceptions and make this a normal part of how we structure our organizations uh, going forward? Now, when I talked about a long history of sort of trying to change organizations using social technology, Usually the main problem is that most companies don't feel uh, that the roof is burning or the burning platform as Stephen Elop um, from Nokia described it. You know, they can survive this year, they can survive next year. Maybe they're going into gradual decline in some areas, but hey, you know, they don't need to act immediately. But I think right now the game is changing in some really important ways and that is forcing companies to radically rethink the way that they create value. So the first thing is, you know, what's a product? What is a product today? It used to be that you design a product, it takes a few years, you mass produce the product, you get it out into market, and the product has a life cycle of five to 10 years. Uh, that's no longer the case. These days, uh, products are often platforms. So if you look at your Twitters and your Facebooks, or if you look at, uh, you know, even, physical products like uh, Tesla and the cars and various other things, products are becoming platforms. In other words, they're just a starting point for interaction with customers, interaction with other companies, and you can build on the product and make new things out of them. That requires an entirely different mindset when it comes to uh, how we structure our product development inside companies. And what we're also finding is that these intangible elements like data, um, services that you can build on your product and the experience of using the product are more important than the underlying hardware. Um, so this is really a question of, you know, why does Android uh, as, a, as a, a phone platform have the majority of the market, but Apple has the majority of the products? Because all they're focused on is not being ahead of Android in terms of the uh, devices and the hardware, but in the experience. And that's where they're very good at what they do. And there are countless other examples of arguably inferior hardware winning because they have superior services, superior experience, and also they know what to do with the data that these products um, throw off. And I think the other big change is that companies used to think that their world was fixed, it wouldn't change, and somewhere out there is the internet with all of its culture and its kittens and cats and cupcakes and all that stuff. But actually now, internet culture is inside and outside. Um, you know, you simply cannot operate an old-fashioned corporate IT system in a company today uh, without people laughing, because when they go home, they can use any tool they like, they can do things quickly, they can operate in a more agile way. And so actually, there is no longer a separation in cultural terms between the people inside a company and their customers and other people outside the company. And that's actually a subtle but very important change, I think, in the way that uh, companies see what they do. So what many companies will try and do is stay the same, but then buy in some data science, or buy in some user experience designers, or buy in what they think of as the missing, uh, the missing skills. But what that produces um, is a clash between the new culture of data and algorithms and the old culture of command and control. So in uh, Volkswagen, you know, somebody issued the instruction saying, we must pass these tests at all costs. And the engineers found a solution. Um, but because the bosses don't fundamentally understand the world of data and software and algorithms, they think it's a small add-on to their physical product, whereas it's actually the future of their product, um, they didn't look too deeply into it. And so now they face a genuine existential crisis. They could disappear, and if the German state doesn't step in, then they're going to have very serious problems uh, paying the money that they owe um, in the US and elsewhere. So I think that's an example of the dangers of not taking this stuff seriously and not actually understanding the power of algorithms and data and services and experience and all of these modern characteristics of the 21st century. So the question for me is um, how can we start to push towards a post-human organization. I don't mean an organization with no humans, I mean one that's not entirely human. It also consists of data and bots and artificial intelligence and all of these other uh, software elements which are coming down the pipe towards us. 
Now, there's a, very, there's a very radical vision of this, which is what they call a distributed autonomous organization, an organization that consists entirely of algorithms. It's not managed by humans. Uh, it's run automatically using things like the blockchain as a distributed ledger to record what's going on and make sure that we know uh, what's happened and it can't be changed. It's interesting, and I think maybe David or Vinay or, or uh, some other colleagues might touch on this uh, later in the afternoon, but I'm still fixated on the rather more boring problem uh, of how we can do this for existing companies today. So there's also a sort of a nice uh, vision of AI in companies, which is the sort of helpful bots. Um, you know, I have Siri on my, on my wrist. It's sort of fun to talk to. It's not trying to replace me. It's just trying to help me. It's trying to help me find uh, the restaurant for lunch. It's telling me what the weather is. It's doing all of these little boring tasks that otherwise I would need to look up myself. Um, I don't know if any of you guys use Slack as a, as a collaboration tool. It's, uh, it's really cool. It's really neat, very, very easy to use. But Slack has this idea of the Slack bot. And the Slack bot has a personality. And it tries to help you. And it points things out to you. And this is a company that actually programmed their Slack bot to tell them to work out. So they had to take exercise regularly. So it's kind of a sweet vision. Um, of AI, and I think that's actually a lot of what we're going to see. We shouldn't be too afraid of algorithmic replacement of all our jobs. Actually, I think in the first wave, most of the AI in companies, whether it's Slack or whether it's Watson from IBM, is all about giving you a little help. Uh, it's just doing some of the boring stuff that you would otherwise need to do yourself. And obviously, we've lived with robots, like real physical robots, for a long time. Uh, this is Tesla's factory uh, in California. It's absolutely robot run, and that's not uncommon uh, for a car company. But what we are seeing more recently is uh, companies like Toyota bringing back humans uh, to work alongside the robots. And there's a very good reason for that. They say that they want to get back to this culture of excellence that they used to have when everything was handmade and when you know, uh, men and women ran the machines rather than the robots uh, running the line. And so they now have this really interesting mixture where they have small robots working alongside highly skilled uh, craftspeople in their factories. And I think that's a better vision for the future than being afraid of everybody being uh, replaced by algorithms um, or, uh, or robots. And what it points to, I think, is this idea that it's not just about artificial intelligence. Algorithms are also about augmented human intelligence. We as humans are almost infinitely capable. We can do extraordinary things. But with a little bit of help from the technology, we can do even more of those things uh, faster and better. So there's a quote from uh, Andrew McAfee's book about the machine age where he says, the best chess player on the planet today is not a computer or a human. The best chess player is a team of humans using computers. And that's a bit like the Toyota story. And I think that's uh, a positive vision for how we can have a human version of this uh, going forward. But when we start to think about algorithms in companies and using AI and so on and so forth, the question is, what do we do with all of these middle managers? Um, you know, we have a generation of sort of corporate drones whose job is not to be good at something, but just to tell people what to do, know how to run the budgeting process, fight battles for, uh, for their position, and so on. And I think that's a really interesting uh, question, because actually, we may think that it's the low-end tasks that are going to get replaced with automation, but actually, a lot of it is the management tasks, because these are not intelligent tasks. These are like reporting tasks, you know, low-level HR tasks. These are the things that software can do really, really well. So I think actually the biggest threat in companies is not to the bottom or the, or the top. It's actually to a middle management layer uh, whose job may not be quite as necessary in the future. And I think there's two other things about these sorts of organizations. One is that we're going to have to sort of live with um, some of our social content, some of our discussion and our ideas coming not just from people but also from bots. So this is an example of IBM's uh, use of Watson during the Wimbledon Tennis Championship. And what they've built is a text interface to a vast array of intelligent data. So if you're a commentator looking at a match, it can actually tell you, oh, by the way, this is the fifth time that this player has scored more than this number of points um, in their career. And that just gives you a bit of help, and you can write your report quicker, and you can do your job better. So it's, it's, it's tackling vast amounts of structured and unstructured data in a very intelligent way, but it's putting it at the fingertips of the people. It's not replacing the people. 
Um, and I think that's interesting. So when we think about our activity streams in companies, our Slack, our IBM connections, our Jive, whatever these tools are that we have in companies, we should really encourage the machines to be talking, whether it's factory production machines, whether it's sort of the buildings themselves, whatever it is, they can be throwing in uh, content into this sort of social realm uh, that the humans can interpret. And human interpretation of data is a really, really interesting area that we're just starting to discover. Um, thanks to uh, somebody last night, we were having a chat about this, and they pointed me to this Italian uh, company, which is now based in, uh, on the east coast of the US, uh, called Decision, which is all about trying to help people make sense of the internet of everything, as they call it. So it enables companies to orchestrate their data flows, pull them together, but to put them in front of humans who can do a better job of interpreting the, the data and find out what it means and what we should do uh, about it. So I think those are three areas where there is a very positive and human case to be made uh, for algorithmic uh, intelligence within, uh, within companies. So um, for me, I think what this points to is that we really need a radical rethinking of the operating system on which organizations today are based. So we looked at the primitive top-down organization chart. Obviously, that's not working. That's not fit for purpose in the modern world. But there's an analogy with software, um, because software used to look like that, actually. Software used to be sort of vertically integrated. So one program would do everything from the horrible user experience all the way down through application logic to the database and storage. And if you wanted to change that system, it's actually really hard because it's all tied together. Whereas these days, software is like a layer cake. You know, you have your storage layers, you have your intelligence layers, you have your service layers, you have your APIs. You know, different interfaces can connect uh, to the same platform and do different things. And I think, in a way, that's a metaphor for what we want to do uh, with organizational structures. So a colleague of mine, uh, Dave Gray, he has this uh, really interesting book called The Connected Company. And these are a couple of uh, sort of sketches from his book. He talks about the need to think about the inside of a company as being like a service-oriented architecture. So each team, each department has sort of interfaces with other departments, and you can put together different products or services just by composing them together, you know, pulling them together much like you would uh, with a software API. And then what that supports is an internal central platform for the company, which is where you sort of invest your application logic and your intelligence and so on, that supports much more free-form human structures on top. So if you want to have what he calls pods, which are sort of autonomous small teams uh, doing different aspects of the work in the company, then you need a very rigid platform uh, on which they can operate, something that provides your HR, it provides your security, it provides your networking, your connectivity, your data, your applications, and so on. And I think that metaphor is, um, is sort of worth playing with, I think, for organizational um, design. It's a bit like what we've learned with our phones. You know, we have either iOS or we have Android, and the platform is very tightly managed. It's very security conscious. We can't mess with the underlying platform unless we sort of jailbreak it. Um, but having a tightly managed platform means that we can have any number of different apps on top that do very different things and are very personal to us and the use case that we have. And I think that's the sort of structure um, you know, on a horizontal level that we need in organizations um, you know, if we're to go beyond this sort of top-down command and control system. So you know, we want sentient thinking organizations, organizations that can learn, that evolve, in some ways are alive, uh, so that we can continually change and improve them. And I think a key part of that is, in fact, the question of data and algorithms and what we do with the data. If you look at uh, recent reports uh, from last month about data projects in companies, what's really interesting is that they were once the, the realm of the CIO or the IT department, no longer. Now they're moving into other areas of the business, and other areas of the business are taking ownership over data and the data platforms so that they can do um, what they need to do. How we socialize that data, like we saw with Decision, and how we make it available to everybody in the company, not just a few, I think is what will give us uh, learning organizations in the future. The kind of characteristics you know, that we're looking for in organizations are about being decentralized, about supporting self-management and autonomy, being agile, 
through agility, being more resilient. You know, this is what 21st century companies look like. This is what successful startups look like. Um, but we can't achieve that with more top-down management. Um, we can achieve that by harnessing the power of algorithms and data and intelligent systems to support better human working and better human cognition um, in the companies that we have today. So very briefly, um, I wanted to just uh, suggest a few ways where any organization, even a, a very sort of uh, structured corporate, can begin in order to create this, uh, this energy and begin a process of change. Um, I think the first thing is to understand, you know, what is the organization for? You know, many of these organizations have been around for a long time, so we never really ask the question. But why do we need this company? Why don't the individual employees just get together, you know, in a co-working space and do what they need to do? What's the purpose of the organization? And when we answer that question, hopefully we come up with some positive capabilities, some positive reasons why the organization should exist, and let's capture those and define them as sort of target capabilities that the organization will need in order to succeed and add value to people in the future. And maybe we can create some sort of organizational health measures by looking at the strength of our networks, looking at who's connected to who, uh, looking at you know, which departments are producing and sharing content and which are not, you know, these sorts of basic things. And then that means that we can dig into the data we can look at our data platforms, we can look at the data exhaust that's being thrown off uh, by some of our IT systems, and we can start to track how these capabilities are developing, what's good about them, what's bad about them, uh, what needs to change, what needs to improve, and then sense check that with the actual real humans uh, who make up the organization. So Dave Snowden, who spoke here last year maybe, or the year before, uh, he talked about this idea of the human sensor network you know, as being probably the most powerful, if you like, computing resource in an organization. And thanks to our connected devices, thanks to our social platforms, we can ask everybody what they think. And so we can ask them, is this capability working for you? Is this process working for your team? Is there anything that's standing in the way of your team uh, doing what it needs to do? And that gives us a whole list of sort of change actions that come from the bottom up. Uh, more like an agile transformation process rather than from the top down in our sort of, you know, consultant-led big bang uh, change program. And I think when you begin this and you start to go around the loop of trying to iterate with agile transformation, you actually unleash a bit of an energy and you give permission to the people in the company that when they see something that's broken or when they see something that's wrong, they can suggest a fix or they can do the, do the fix themselves. So we, we talk about this as pointing towards the quantified organization. Uh, so right now, loads of HR technology companies are using big data to focus more and more keenly on the individual performance of workers in the company. So there's more corporate surveillance, there's more real-time performance management, and okay, that's gonna exist, and that can bring some marginal benefits to productivity, but why don't we point that laser in the other direction? Point it at the organization and say, okay, well, is the organization fit for purpose? Is it helping these employees do their work, or is it getting in the way? And where it's getting in the way, let's be brave enough uh, to begin that process of change, and always, be on the lookout for those employee issues, problems, needs, things that are broken that can inform small iterative uh, change actions that we can also back up through data uh, to give us an idea of what needs to change. And I think this, for me, is absolutely critical to giving a sense of ownership o over the organization to the employees um, that work within it. But to do it, we really do need to go back to the basic cultural issues around management. So we need to have a lot more leadership um, and probably a lot less management in organizations today. And so, you know, what will a future leader look like in an organization? Well, maybe they're a frustrated change agent who's trying to just improve their team. Maybe they're not on the formal management fast track. Maybe they're not on the management development program. But maybe we can uncover the wonderful work they're doing and we can encourage them to show leadership within the organization. They don't need to get to a senior position in order to show leadership. It's a quality that can exist really throughout, uh, throughout the organization. So I think for me, in sort of wrapping up, I really do believe that connectivity and sort of networks is our new superpower 
um, as humans. And I think humans are capable of doing just about anything when they're connected together with a sense of common purpose and they want to get things done. The problem is that most of our organizational structures and processes are getting in the way of that. They think that you have to tell people what to do rather than allow people to go uh, towards a goal or towards a mission um, on their own. And so when we consider the whole issue of algorithms, uh, are they scary? Are they going to replace uh, jobs? Or are they helpful, like the little Slack bots? I think there's a very positive case to be made that a modern algorithmic organization that's in touch with its own data, that has an operating system that's fit for the 21st century, can help us use this superpower in a much better way. Uh, and so I'm quite optimistic that even some of the bigger, older companies uh, that look like they're struggling to adapt today, if they let uh, the data flow and they let their people get on with it, I think even they are capable uh, of finding a place uh, in, the, in the 21st century. Um, thank you. <laughs>